Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Lindsay Whitehurst, who is the first of the Honors Thesis presenters. Uh, her research advisor is Professor Lee. My name is Lindsay Whitehurst, and as Professor Pisano just said, I've been working with Professor Lee. And today I'll be covering my research on solar powered microwave transmission for remote sensing and communications. So, here's a basic outline for what I'll be covering today. First, I'll go through some mot the motivation or what inspired this work. Then, I'll go through my goals and how I approach those goals. Then, I'll show some quantitative results and then go through the theoretical study that's been carried out. And then I'll go into some future work and give you a short conclusion and summary. So first, what motivated this research? Well, it's been researched since the 70s to put a satellite in orbit around Earth to collect solar energy and then radiate that collected power down to Earth in the form of microwaves. So as you can see, here are these solar cells collecting that solar power and then a microwave antenna array radiating that power down. So my thesis research is derived from this concept, except with uh, the solar energy being harvested on the surface of the Earth rather than in space and using it for communications and remote sensing rather than as a major source of power. So my goals in this research were first to propose a, a system for solar power microwave transmission and perform a quantitative analysis on that proposed system and secondly to perform a theoretical study on microwave interactions with the atmosphere in order to determine the power threshold for microwave transmission. So here, oh, wrong way. Here is the conceptualized overall system. We have a solar thermal photovoltaic system, a power electronic system, and a microwave antenna array. And this solar thermal photovoltaic system is composed of a Fresnel lens, a selective emitter, and a filter, and then the photovoltaic cells themselves. And this will power the uh, power electronic device and the microwave antenna array. So the approaches in analyzing this system include first a proof of concept analysis. And this is basically to demonstrate that using the transfer matrix method can be a different numerical approach in the analysis of solar power microwave transmission system. And secondly, uh, an investigation of microwave interactions with the atmosphere. And this is done in order to determine the power limit for transmission to avoid possible disturbances to Earth's atmospheric environment. So first, the proof of concept analysis. The solar thermophotovoltaic system is composed of a Fresnel lens, which allows a high concentration of solar radiation to hit this emitter and allow this emitter to reach within a desired temperature range. And this emitter is chosen so that it absorbs solar energy with a high efficiency and has a selective emission spectrum. Therefore, this high temperature emitter will then radiate um, will emit radiation within a known range of wavelengths. And the emitted photons will then pass through this periodic structure or filter that will further reflect radiation back to the emitter to be reabsorbed. However, this transmitted radiation will be within a narrow wavelength range corresponding to the band gap wavelength of the photovoltaic cells. And that radiation will then reach these photovoltaic cells. So in order to analyze this system, I use the transfer matrix method to study the transmission of electromagnetic waves. So this transfer matrix method basically relates the input electromagnetic wave to the output electromagnetic wave. And this is why I was able to analyze the optical properties of the intermediate structure for this STBV system. So using this method, you can find an overall matrix to represent the system and then solve for the reflection and transmission coefficients. And then you can basically graph the reflectance or transmittance or absorption for any optical um, or photonic crystal. So in our conceptualized system, the filter is a periodic photonic crystal made up of silicon and silicon dioxide. And it's designed so that the central wavelength of transmission is around the band gap wavelength of the um, photovoltaic cells. So using this transfer matrix method, I was able to reproduce the results for this intermediate structure. 
So the band gap wavelength for the photovoltaic cells in our system is around 1.7 micrometers and as you can see this is wavelength versus reflectance and there's high reflectance above and below that uh, band gap wavelength for the solar cells. So coupled with the tungsten emitter the output power for this whole STBV system will be we found to be about 1.5 watts per square centimeter and this will power the electronic system and then the microwave antenna array. And this leads to the second part of my thesis, which is the theoretical study of microwave interactions with the atmosphere. So using this solar energy to power a microwave antenna array can consequently produce electron plasma density um, fluctuations represented by these orange dots and geomagnetic field fluct um, fluctuations represented by this dark green wave along this geomagnetic field line. And I've shown that this is traveling upward, but can actually travel in either direction along the geomagnetic field lines. So let's go into a little more detail about the generation of these irregularities. Well first, here's electric Gauss's law. And it shows that an apparent electric field caused by nonlinear forces acting on electrons may cause an electron plasma density fluctuations. Now this apparent electric field can be caused primarily by two different nonlinear forces that are acting on electrons additively. And these are the thermal pressure force and the radiation pressure force. Now secondly, the generation of the geomagnetic field fluctuations. Well, this apparent electric field caused by these nonlinear forces, together with the Earth's magnetic field, will lead to an E cross B drift of electrons, and this produces an electric current. And these current probations will then result in Earth's magnetic field fluctuations, as you can see here in, according to Ampere's law. Now we wanted to know what are the configurations of these irregularities. Well, in earlier experiments in Puerto Rico, using HF heater waves and for HF I'm talking about you know around 3 to 30 megahertz. Now these the ionospheric density fluctuations induced from this HF heater wave experiment are in the form of parallel plate waveguides. And more recently in experiments in Alaska they were able to successfully reproduce these results and also confirm the prediction that there will be a simultaneous generation of ionospheric plasma density irregularities in geomagnetic field fluctuations. Now this is for using HF waves, like I said. So, and with HF waves, they split into two component waves when they reach um, a certain height within the ionosphere. And they split into the O mode and X mode waves. And this is because for high frequency, their wave frequency is nearly the same as the local um, plasma frequency in that area. So with HF waves, they form these two parallel plate waveguide configurations according to the different modes. Now we're using microwaves in my case. So, and this is, you know, gigahertz, a few gigahertz. So this wave frequency is exceeding the local plasma frequency and the electron cyclotron frequency by almost three orders of magnitude. So this bifringent effect or splitting into two component waves is negligible. So this is why we expect that the microwave generated ionospheric waveguides to be a filament type of structure. Um, and, and this is because the K vector of these waves will be perpendicular to the B field, but it can be in any direction around the B field, and that's why it's forming this filament shape. So now this instability caused by microwaves has a threshold, and it's determined by electron collisions and diffusion loss. So let's say this is the area under um, in illuminated by microwave radiation, then the electrons in this area will experience two different forces, and that's the radiation pressure force and the thermal pressure force, like I mentioned earlier. Now these electrons experiencing these forces will then collide with other particles in that region. And these electron collisions have multiple roles. First, they produce that heat source that gives rise to the thermal pressure force. Secondly, they impose a damping mechanism that leads to the threshold. And finally, they reduce heat conduction loss along the Earth's magnetic field line. Now, because of these roles of the electron collisions, the ionospheric E region is the major region of concern. And this is because, as you can see, this is the equation for electron collision frequency. It consists of two parts, electron neutral collision frequency and electron ion collision frequency. And in the E region, the electron neutral collision frequency is dominant, whereas in the F region, it's the electron ion collision frequency. Now in the E region, 
this collision frequency is a few megahertz, whereas in the F region, it's only a few kilohertz. And this is for approximately the same uh, electron densities. And this is why the E region is more, um, more important for study. And I also mentioned diffusion loss. What well, imposes an instability threshold on the thermal pressure force? Because electrons can move along the geomagnetic field lines. So here's a table comparing these three key damping mechanisms. We have collisional damping, cross field damping, and parallel thermal diffusion. And here are the three equations for solving each. And down here I've just shown some of the parameters that I've used to actually calculate these numbers. Now in the E region, as you can see, the collisional damping is dominant. However, in the F region, parallel diffusion loss exceeds collisional damping, as you see here, comparing these. So this filamentation instability cannot occur in the F region because we have this large parallel diffusion loss. Now, if these elect um, as shown on the previous slides, electron collisions impose the primary damping mechanism in the E region. And the threshold field to excite this filamentation instability is found to be about half a volt per meter. This is using the parameters for the E region as shown on the previous page. And this is, this 0.5 volt per meter is the microwave electric field intensity in the E region. So now what's the future work? Well, we want to develop an integrated power electronic circuit that is compact and powered at low voltages. So currently, only large devices that operate at high voltages are used for microwave generation. However, projects such as like the Space Powered Satellite Program that I had mentioned earlier, they operate, um, they propose, which proposes to use a microwave transmission system on a satellite in orbit around Earth um, and using solar power to um, operate the microwave transmission. This would require that the device be powered at low voltages and are compact which is the same case here. And secondly, we'd also like to test our predicted microwave um, wave ionospheric E-region interactions, possibly using the Arecibo microwave radar at 2.38 gigahertz. So here's a brief summary. I uh, successfully reproduced these results for the solar thermophotovoltaic system, demonstrating that this transfer matrix method can be a different numerical approach in the analysis of such systems. And secondly, we carried out a theoretical study that shows that high-powered microwave transmission should not exceed certain power limits to avoid possible disturbances to Earth's atmospheric environment. So the use of this environmentally friendly system consists not only of exploring a renewable resource to power the transmission of signals, but also preventing any significant perturbations to the environment from injected wave interactions. And that's it. a constant refractive, refractive index. I know they, um, they can change with wavelength, but we assumed a constant, yeah. Anything else? Okay.